right, uh, my name is Julie Pearson Littlefender. Today is February 10th, 2013, and I'm at the Tulsa Indian Arts Festival with artist Skip Roll, who's done this show for many years. Skip, you're of Choctaw descent. You've won a number of top awards at some of the top Southeastern shows. You've been named a master artist of the five tribes. You work in multiple media, but you're perhaps best known for your miniature scrimshaw work, usually focused on wildlife images. Thank you for taking the time to speak with me today. Sure, you're quite welcome. Where were you born and where did you grow up? I was born in Durant, Oklahoma, and I spent most of my childhood in Atoka County around a little town called Stringtown, and then I graduated from high school in Atoka. What did your folks do for a living? Well, my dad was a barber, and uh, when he wasn't barber, he was fighting somewhere. And my, <laughs> my, my, my grandma was a well-known bootlegger in the county, and <laughs> but my mom, she kept everything together. She uh, retired from the public service company. Um, did you have a, is your Choctaw on your mom's side or your dad's side? Uh, it's on my dad's. Did you have a relationship with your grandparents on either side? Uh, yeah, uh, I did. My, uh, like I say, my bootlegging grandmother was one side of my dad's family and they, they were, uh, uh, a little sketchy in places all through history, you know, but uh, <laughs> on my mom's side, why, uh, my grandfather there was a welder and a lay minister. Uh-huh. So you got to be around both yeah. grandparents a little bit. Um, was anybody in your family or extended family artistically gifted? No, uh, not that I know of, you know. Uh, I think there was talent there, but it was something that back then that in that in our culture you just didn't do. I can remember when I was a child, I'd hide behind the bed and draw pictures on cardboard boxes and stuff. My mom always tried to keep me in color books and stuff when I was little, but my dad thought being drawing and painting was a sissy out deal, you know, and so at one point in my life I completely quit for about fifteen years and never even did anything because I just got tired of being made fun of and you know you're not manly you got to do this you know if you're not hunting or, or trying to kill something why you're, you're not on the main line so you know it was one of the biggest influences I had uh, though was my second grade teacher she was an Indian lady named Baba Luth Backer and uh, just, she took me to my first art competition in the second grade to do rent. I, re I always remember that I drew a chicken, and uh, but she all she was encouraged me, you know, and, and kind of fed what I was was needing there. So that's basically how I got started. That can make a huge difference. So the ages when you were really discouraged and you kind of put it aside were um, around nine or ten. Yeah, so. long in there, you know, mm -hmm. twelve to. Uh, until I went to college, you know, mm -hmm. and, and I went to uh, I uh, have a degree in commercial art and advertising from mm -hmm. OSU Tech, and uh, then I went from there to uh, Dallas, Texas, and worked for uh, Frontier Theaters Advertising. We were doing uh, billboards for theaters and stuff. Wow. Um, I was going to ask you real quickly, uh, did your grandma speak the language? Did you get to be around the Choctaw language at all? No, uh, not that I don't even remember. Mm -hmm. About all they did was just cuss in English. <laughs> That's it's a good language for, for that, isn't it? Um, did you have any other teachers uh, either at the secondary level or high school level that encouraged your artistic talent? Uh, no. I. When I was in high school, we didn't have an, an art class there at Toka, but you know, they was always coming after me to draw something uh, for the your classmates. Your book or something, you know, and different things like that. Yeah. Um, so when did you sell your first piece of art? Oh gosh. You know, I don't even really remember. I think it was probably uh, after I came out of the Army. You okay, know. not in high school. No. no. Um, so, in the Army, did you utilize your artistic skills at all? Yeah, I, I wound up after they found out that I could do some of that stuff. Why, uh, I'd had to 
assigned to paint the company logos on different things and in various occasions you know I got a chance to use a little bit of it. And you were enlist you enlisted as opposed to Yeah. Uh -huh. in, um, so you got a degree in commercial art. How, what kind of a base do you think that provided for you that you draw upon today? Well, to be honest with you, really very little. Uh, of course, the type of stuff to do today uh, really didn't have much to do with that. I did uh, I worked at Frontier uh, Airlines for a while in, in a silk screen department and doing that stuff. As far as the type of stuff I do now, it was uh, really did carry over much, you know. Mm -hmm. That was more commercial with silk screen work and, and that, that type of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but at some point, um, you did leave Texas, and I guess you were working in Dallas at that yeah. point. Was that a big change of environment for oh, you? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you know. And, and that's an easy place to see him down there for a young man. <laughs> but but I, I worked there, you know, and and, and I had, it was a good job, but after about three or four months of that, I just, I'd catch myself, uh, if I'd see somebody coming down the street in a horse trailer, I'd trot along and try to see who if I knew them and stuff, you know, and I just needed, it just wasn't for me being in an environment like that. I needed some woods and, and some <laughs> open air, you know. <laughs> Um, and then when you came back to Oklahoma, at some point you went to work for a saddle maker and learned leather yeah. tooling? Yeah, I, I rodeoed for uh, probably 35 years and and uh, I got into, uh, which that had an art background too because of tooling and leathers with the scroll work and different things, you know, and, and I made a lot of saddles, repaired a lot of them. And, and, uh, made a lot of leather goods of different kinds, you know. So you, were you kind of partially earning a living from rodeo and part, yeah, partly yeah, from I, I saddle made making? A, I made a, some decent wages at it, you know, and, and I always uh, had an eye for a good horse. I bought and sold some good horses and over the years and shipped a lot of them to California and different places. And it got to where when a lot of people I knew in different states needed a the right kind of horse they called me up I, I kept them everything kind of rolling that away too you know were you also kind of drawing on the side a little bit while you were rodeoing no uh, basically not a lot of times if we was going on a long trip I'd take me a piece of wood and sit back the camper and carve out something you know and everybody gripe because of wood chips everywhere but you know <laughs> that's something if it's a, and and I truly believe this and, and when I go to a, an art class to talk to kids or young people, you know, I, I'm a full believer that God gave every human that was ever born a talent of some kind, but it's in its infant form, and it's up to you to develop it, and, uh, and so if that's in you, you're going to be, I've sat in the woods and carved things and stuff, you know, just, it just it's there and it's going to come out, you know, but it takes you to take it from the infant stage to the polish it, perfect it, and get it to the point that you can. And one of the worst mistakes that, that I try to talk to young people about that, that have a, a lot of talent, it's real easy, uh, especially, and I saw this happen, and I know Merlin has too, that you see a, a young person with a lot of talent, and they have some success, they sell a piece or two, and pretty soon they start making it to sell. And any time you do that, you're going to lose it. You do each piece like you plan on keeping it yourself, that you'd be proud to hang it in your own house. Then if you sell it, uh, you keep your quality and you keep your reaching for just a little bit more all the time. So uh, I do sell a lot of my stuff. And the fact, I'm a full-time artist. It's the way I make a living. But I don't make it to sell. That's a nice, thank you, nice distinction. Um, so you were already, I think it sounds like in your early 20s, kind of gravitating towards that three-dimensional work. Yeah, yeah, you know. Did your leather tooling provide any kind of base for your eventual discovery of Scrimshaw? How did, how did you discover? Yeah, that was something that always fascinated me. I, of course, 
my culture, I love knives and different things, and I would see uh, some scrimshaw on knife handles or pistol handles or something, you know, and I, I never could figure out how they did it, you know. And I finally found a book, and I don't remember who wrote it. If I did, I wouldn't tell you because it's the worst thing I ever got hold of. And, and so I took that thing. Well, it took me a year to work all that stuff out of me to get it. I, I looked at a couple of early pieces that I found in a drawer here about a year ago, and it looks like he cut them out with a hatchet. And, and so that was what I had got from that book. So I, I just kept working down until I developed my own tools, which basically is absolutely nothing but a sewing needle stuck in the end of a dowel rod. And that's what I do all my work with. And you figured that out for yourself, yeah. not, not from the scrimshaw book. Did the leather tooling help at all, though, do you think, with that fine? Oh, yeah, I still uh, incorporate some of it. In fact, I sold a piece yesterday. It was on a uh, scrimshaw uh, piece of fossil walrus ivory, uh, a little necklace pendant. And uh, I used the same old leather pattern that I used to use in the leather shop. Uh, the only difference was, I, instead of putting acorns or something, I put little flowers and leaves and, and scrolled a couple of hummingbirds around it. And, and so, yeah, you still use some of that. That's neat. So, when did you um, first start entering shows, art shows, native art shows? The first one I entered was uh, a friend of mine uh, there in McAllister named Christine Verner, who uh, has studied art from every famous artist in the world, I guess, at one time or another. Uh, heard that I was doing some scrimshaw stuff and came and bought a couple of knives off of me and he encouraged me to enter a, a art show in the Holdenville, a little small deal, and, and I did a couple of pastels. and. I won the first place with one and something with the other one, you know, and so uh, that kind of where I got started, you know, I, and I was scared to death. I didn't want to take it because I thought then, and this is something else I share with young people, just because you enter a piece and you don't win with it, that doesn't mean your stuff's not any good. It's either one or two men's opinion, and, and I have judged some art shows, and I, I really have to uh, discipline myself for not gravitating towards the things that I like personally, rather than maybe this over here with a little better quality. So, so that's, that has absolutely nothing to do with your talent, whether you win first or, or second or don't at all, because the next place, you, you, it, it all balances itself out, you know. But anyway, that's where I started. That was the first one. At Holdenville, yeah. Um, so even though she had bought your scrimshaw and was interested in it, you entered pastels for that yeah. one. Were they wildlife images? Uh, no, the, uh, the one that I entered over there was a uh, Plains Indian holding a spirit shield. And the reason I didn't take any scrimshaw is because she told me, she said, I'm not sure that people even know what that is. And I have had, I, the strangest thing that happened to me, and I'm not going to tell you which art show it was, I uh, don't want to offend anybody, but it was a well-known art show. Still going on right now. I had a piece of scrimshaw over there and I went to pick my stuff up and I didn't win nothing which you know that's okay but that curator told me he said this is the biggest thing I ever saw and he said I don't know whether I would tell you this or not <clears throat> I said we had two judges one of them wanted to give you first place one of them said that that wasn't real that it was done with lasers and he said they got in an argument and said what they decided to do was just not judge you at all because they didn't even, to be honest with you, he said they didn't know what it was. And so I have, have run into that. So probably in the early <coughs> days, then you were sort of in the process of educating people about what Scrimshaw was so, as yeah, well. Yeah, in this area now, it's well known on the coast and different places, you mm -hmm. know, but it, it's uh, uh, something was new for this area, you know. Mm -hmm. What kinds of materials did you start out using when you first started experimenting with scrimshaw? Well, uh, I have done it on just about any anything you can scratch, but I first started out with, uh, because you know, I couldn't afford the real stuff and didn't know where to get it, uh, uh, fossil ivory. Uh, I really made it a point not to ever use uh, 
modern Elfin Ivory. Uh, just for the simple reason, I love the old stuff better. It has better color to it and stuff. And I don't want to offend anybody or I don't want to get any kind of ivory that came from black market stuff. So I just always refuse to use that. Uh, but when I started out, I, would, I bought some imitation ivory. It's called micarta. It's actually made from ivory dust and epoxy. And you buy it in sheets and cut it out. And it, you can do decent stuff, but nothing like the real thing, you know. So, um, was your subject matter primarily wildlife in the early scrimshaw works? Yeah, uh, did a lot of wildlife, and, and I've always did some type of Indian stuff, maybe buffaloes mm -hmm. or an incorporated teepee and something, you know, but mm -hmm. basically a lot of it was just wildlife. Uh, seemed like the market, I, I got started to wildlife pieces, well, somebody see that said, well, do me a deer, or can you do this on that, you know, so there for a while, I was pretty much just kind of doing, looked like this was the way to go, so. I did a lot, a lot of, I still do some wildlife, but mm -hmm. basically now I do uh, a lot of uh, just basically five tribe stuff mm -hmm. anymore, you know, I, I go back and take, uh, I like to go back uh, in the early uh, stuff is when they, the traders were coming over and trading blankets and different things and the tribes were torn between the French, English colonies and all that, you know, and I'm, I'm trying to work in that area. I love the uh, the different types. Uh, one piece that I, I did I really liked, and uh, I believe it may be archived in the Five Tribes Museum. I think Miss Griffin bought it, but uh, it was a an Indian standing uh, had a English trade musket, a French blanket, uh, I think it was a French knife, and uh, a Spanish, all these different things that they were getting as trade goods and, and standing there with the look and stuff that I captured in that was like, I don't know which side to join. You know, what do we do? Where do we go from here? We're, we, we don't know, you know. We're caught in the middle of all this turmoil and, and we'll never be the same. And I've got a piece that I'm working on now uh, that I plan on uh, putting in the master show is a Spanish man standing there with all the old Spanish garb on the armor and all that, standing talking to a Cherokee and basically there before they ever got anything, you know, in the original uh, dress and stuff and a couple more whispering over that we'll never be the same, you know, because here's a guy fixing to give us some blankets and the knives and all this stuff. So what we know all our lives is fixing to change, you know, so that the area that I'm really interested in trying to show right now. That, that one piece sounds really wonderful, too. Um, <clears throat> what was one of your most exciting early awards? Uh, I guess it would be uh, winning the best of show with the, the uh, uh, competitive show there at the Five Tribes Museum. You know, that was the first time that I actually felt like maybe I do belong in this, you know. Maybe this is what I need to do. And, and it was for a piece of scrimshaw work. Yeah. You also won second place uh, in sculpture at Colorado Indian Market in 1985. Was that a big show, bigger show than yeah, the ones you've been to? Yeah, it was a real big show. And, and uh, I never saw so many people in my life, you know. It, it, it snowed that night that we got there about two feet. And I told my wife, I said, there will be 10 people here. And so we go to the building, I walk in there and I, uh, before the show, and I walk the door and look, <clears throat> and there's people lined up as far as you could see, four abreast in the snow waiting to get in there. And the piece that I was going to enter, uh, I had came across a man found a, uh, an old uh, large whale's tooth at a flea market, and he brought it to me. And I, particularly was going to do this piece for that show out there. And so I started out at the top of this, after I polished this tooth, uh, 
and it's beautiful ivory. Holds a tremendous amount of detail, way better than elephant ivory or stuff. Uh, the mastodon, but I started out with the eagle at the top line, and then the Rocky Mountains it came down, and it had a, a circle this tooth. It had some big horn sheep, and then it came on down into elk, and uh, then right down at the bottom it worked its way down to a beaver pond and stuff. You know, and I had it on a base and had it. Uh, on a base that turned where it slowly rotated. Well, I had told a doctor in Muskogee I was working with, he said, I want to see it before you take it. So we stopped by on our way to Denver and he was up in the operating room. He came down in his operating gear. I don't know what his patient was doing, still had his mask on and all that. And I had it sitting on the hood and it turned around. He said, what do you want with that? I said, well, I don't want to sell it right now because this is a piece that I'm taking out there to enter in that. And he said, well, what's first place out there? I said, it's a thousand dollars. He said, uh, he said, I'll, he said, what are you going to want for this piece? I said, I'll, I'll, of course, back then I was, I will price that cheaper than what the tooth was. Now I said, I'll take 500 for the piece. He said, okay, so if I give you $1,500, I can have this now and you can play <laughs> like you won. I said, oh, okay, you know, <laughs> so we make the deal and I get out there and I'm not going to enter anything. My wife said, yeah, you are. And I picked up a little old piece that wasn't three inches tall and it was on a base. And she actually took it and put it in sculpture. I said, you got to be nuts. They had bronzes out there and everything. And I ended up winning the cat. I was embarrassed, you know. <laughs> I, and people look at you funny like, but you know, what do you do? <laughs> you found a category yeah. though. It's <laughs> yeah. That's a great story. Um, you did a lot of traveling to Texas early on. What was different from the Texas market than the, what's different between the two markets, Texas and Oklahoma? Well, to be honest with you, I mean, I'm an Okie through and through. The money is better in Texas. Uh, money is, is uh, even this year, uh, I did a show there in, uh, I can't think of the name of that town. Right, it's actually in Dallas. It's just they call it something else. And I had a show there in July, and and when everything was pretty much, you know, as well as I do, when the economy gets bad, art's the first thing that takes a hit. But uh, that show was an outside show, which I very rarely ever do one of them. I don't like them, but I did this anyway, and I just sold nearly everything I had, you know. So the economy is was better there, and that's what made the difference, mm -hmm. you know. Um, sometimes the business aspect of art is hard to master, and I'm wondering what some of your early lessons in that area were. I have never been much of a businessman. My banker just laughs at me, and he says, he, and he told, I don't know if this is true or not, I'm not a scientist, but he said, artists' brains are different than in other people. He said, you work off of a creative deal. He said, mine is fine. He said, you let me handle your finances, and you just do your artwork, you know, so that's basically, uh, I don't know, you know, I just, one thing is, is uh, I'm never, uh, and still I get griped at, I don't price my stuff high enough, you know. To me, I don't know why anybody would want to give that kind of money for something like that I had fun doing, you know. Now, if I was out there digging a post hole, it's different, but this, uh, it doesn't come hard. There was times that I, you, you know, you have to fight your way through different areas to get to a point. But, but now, you know, I don't really have to wrestle with a piece. I can pretty much look at it for a while. I don't just grab a piece and go to work on it. I'll keep it laying around for a few days and let it tell me what it wants to be, and then just put it on there. You know, so I don't. Uh, that was probably my biggest mistake. It was not pricing my stuff for actually what it was worth or what it would bring. You know. Um, so, what role does Cleora play in, in the business? Oh, she keeps my clothes done up, <laughs> more <laughs> my socks, but she's been good to go with me as my helpmate, you know, not just in, in life, but in my art business. She helps me cover stuff and, and make sure that the curtains are straight and the table's clean and all that, you know. And, and uh, it would be hard to do uh, what I do without her, you know. Yep. 
Um, how would you, so you kind of got busier on the show scene in the 1980s, is that right? Yeah, uh, basically. Um, what was one of your early galleries that you think was important to your career? Uh, well, I, I, the first stuff I put in the gallery was in uh, Mrs. Vernon Gallery there in McAllister. And, and some of the local clientele bought some pieces and stuff. And my career has never just taken a great leap from being here to there. It was a process. And I, I think most everybody's that way. You know, you, you just have to, people that buy serious art, they want to know whether you're for real or not. Are you just uh, going to be here and do this for a while and then going to be gone? And once that you establish yourself, is, and, and they know that you're going to continue, you're going to be there, you're going to continue in their shows, that your bio is going to grow. And, and so uh, people buy art because they like it. And I tell people, I've had people come and look at my stuff and, and, and my opinion, I don't know if this is correct or not, but I, when you first see something, if it appeals to you right then, Nine times, you'll be happy with it. If you have to talk to yourself into buying something just because you want to spend some money and tell somebody what you gave for something, it's not going to be long. It's in the back room back there somewhere, you know. So so that has a lot to do with it, you know. And I don't want to sell uh, somebody something just because they want to spend some money. I want them to like this. I want them to enjoy it. And, and I was at this uh, same show back when we had it at the fairgrounds, and there was a, I had a painting that I did of just a, uh, maybe a 18 by 24 or something smaller type painting of a, ended with a red blanket on. And this young couple kept coming by there about four or five times, and they would look at it, and I could hear them stepping over there, step over and talk. And one of them, I think the painting was like $750 or something. She said, they were all right, well, well, we can't afford that. Oh, we want that, but can we not do that? And I, you know, I'm just getting pieces of this. Mm -hmm. And the show was about over, and they came back by and looked at it again. And I said, "Y'all really like that piece, don't you?" I said, "Oh, yes, we love it." I said, "We just cannot work that into our budget right now." They were probably in their early twenties, and I said, "I'm going to tell you what I do." I said, "If you'll pay me for what I got in that frame, I'm going to give you this picture." Just for the simple reason is because y'all love it, and I know you'll enjoy it, and I want you to have it. And they like the fellow, and I still get Christmas cards from them, you know. And so that, and I've had people that bought stuff that I knew. They just wanted to spend some money, you know. And, and so I, I had rather, I have to sell this stuff, but but I got more enjoyment out of giving them that piece than I did selling maybe some other pieces, you know. That's, that's a great story. Um, how do you think the Native art scene changed from the 80s to the 90s? And maybe you haven't been in the gallery, on the gallery scene as, in, you know, enough to notice those changes, but maybe booth shows too from the 80s to the 90s. How did it change? Well, you know, it, it uh it's like anything it goes back again to how the economy's flowing. You know, uh, it has its ups and then it'll have its lows and it'll get back up again. And and uh, I still have maintained a pretty steady uh, movement of my work through these periods. Uh, a lot of times I have to, uh, I have a developed a line of customers that pretty much I can do something and know, hey, he'll like this. You know, most of my stuff I sell over the telephone. <laughs> you know, I don't travel uh, like I did because uh, we adopted a little girl about 18 years ago and, and she was just like two weeks old and, and I didn't just want to leave this little orphan with somebody to take care of while we travel. So I, I started cutting back on shows and just doing local stuff and trying to, you know, uh, there's more important things in life than making money, you know, and so uh, I cut back there and then now that she's, I have to brag on her a little bit, she just, she scored a 33 on her ACT and that wasn't good enough. She took it again yesterday and wants to get it up to a 34 and, and she plays softball, she, uh, class president, she just does everything, you know. Uh, but I think 
it's like anything in life. You have to prioritize. What's the word? Prioritize. Yeah, that's yep. what I'm trying to say. <laughs> but you have to put things in perspective, you know. And as I continue to do my art there, a lot of times I would depend on just calling the customer, say, I have this piece, I'll send you a photograph of it if you'd like. And, and so that's, uh, that's the way I go. And I, I do have done business with the uh, Eagle Tree Gallery down by Nashville in uh, uh, Jerry Ellis, and, and he's he's been a good outlet too, you know. And I know that there's times if we go to a show and the show the crowds are not very good and the show's been a little weak that I know times he's come over and bought things just on that account, you know. So developing relationships like that with gallery owners and, and people that all you put it all in a pot, stir it up, and it keeps you going. Mm -hmm. you know? um, in 1990, the Indian Arts and Crafts Act was passed, and I wondered if you remember the impact that had kind of on the, the Native arts scene. Oh, the definitely. Uh, you know, and, and uh, I think it conception was a good thing. Uh, I know that, and I've been to shows to where people were selling uh, China made beads and Japanese stuff like that, and pawn them off on people is is Indian craft, and and I think that that definitely needed to have been stopped. I think that that part was a good thing. I think it kind of got out of hand, you know. Uh, I know as well as is my family, and we researched it, and and I have enough documentation that I could get a card right now, but I refuse to do it. And there's been shows that I've been. Uh, kicked out of on that account. And people say, why don't you do it? Uh, it goes back and, and like I say, we go back and, and trace it back to a, a, an Indian named Notosh Tubby, who was an interpreter on the Trail of Tears. I have copies of letters that my great grandmother wrote to so white men could come into her allotment and work on her farm, you know. But they were not on the road because they did not want their children sent off to some Indian school somewhere. And so that was a choice they made. And I just thought I would honor that. Uh, if they don't let me in a show, I'll just go to another one. And so it kind of got out of hand that way. I know uh, up there at Lost City, there's some Cherokee people that can't even speak English that are not card holders. They have to bring somebody with them when they get ready to sell their stuff. And, and that's wrong, you know. Uh, so it has its pros and cons, and it has definitely affected uh, some shows, and some of them it hasn't. So you know, I just I just learned to go with. That's the thing about being in as long as I have. Uh, I can get into a show anywhere, pretty much when I want to. I don't have to mail in photographs, and you know, I can just send them a bio and and go. So uh, it's opened up for me, but it took time. You know, it's not nothing, it just, and so I actually think the act was a good thing. Uh, it's like anything, no, it, if you're not careful, it gets out of control. Mm -hmm. um, how did it um, feel to be, to, to earn that title, Master Artist of the Five Tribes? What did that mean to you? Oh, it was great, you know. Uh, I had friends like Bill Rabbit and stuff. When I first got started, Bill and I got to be good friends and and uh, several others. And and I something that I thought, well, I don't know if I'll ever make that or not, you know. And, and uh, I have never been real high on myself as far as thinking that I'm it, you know. I've always. A lot of times when I'd win something, I would actually feel self-conscious because I won. Uh, but anyway, it was it was a great thing, and it was a, a real boost to to my business, you know, because it gives you certain uh, authenticity. And I have sold several pieces just because I had that plate on my desk or on my table that I am a master artist of five civilized tribes. So it gives you some credibility because most people know that you don't get that unless you earn it, you know. Mm -hmm. And it took several years of just continuing uh, with the shows and different things and winning and, and, and so that's, uh, it was a tremendous boost, you know, and I'm proud of it. Yeah. Um, 
What's the most memorable comment or piece of feedback you got from a collector? I'm sorry, I didn't really get um, that question. What's the most memorable feedback you've gotten from a collector or comment? <laughs> well, I guess the, the funniest thing is, and I also got, I had a guy gave me a moose antler one time, and I threw that thing around on my porch at the shop and kicked it out of the way two or three times. Like, what am I going to do with this? <laughs> one day I got the idea to carve it. So I set it up and I carved it, uh, eagle in it, put it on a base, everything, and I've done it. Uh, in fact, I have I always have some there. Uh, it's one of my better selling items, you know. And uh, we were at. You mean moose antlers now? Yeah. Yes. And we were at a show, I want to say it was in Arlington, Texas. And this man came up with some friends that he was visiting. He was from uh, Norway, he didn't speak any English. But he fell in love with this eagle carving and he bought it. And we got a phone call from the friends that lived in Dallas and, and told me, said he would not let them ship that. Said he carried that back to Norway in his lap on the airplane <laughs> and said he wouldn't allow now anybody to touch it. And then about a week later, I get this letter from Norway, wrote in Norwegian, and I still don't to this day know what it says. So I don't know if it, what happened, but I, you know, I thought, that's pretty neat that this guy liked that enough that he wouldn't even allow him to mail it, that he's going to carry it in his lap, you know. <laughs> and, but here, I've, I've still got this Norwegian letter, and I don't know if it's good or bad, but I'm hanging on to it. <laughs> <laughs> Till you find a translator. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, we're doing it on time. We're, we're good. Um, we're going to shift into your philosophies and practices a little bit. Um, a little bit more technical discussion, but not super technical for our. Um... Scrimshaw work is very miniature, and that's a, it's working in a different scale. Um, what helped you the most kind of get a hold of that scale? Well, some of my stuff, actually, some of the things I do now are considered large for scrimshaw, because I do some pieces that are maybe two and a half, three inches by four or five inches, you know, and, and I put them in shadow boxes and stuff, but it, it uh, basically, considering it against painting and stuff, yes, it is uh, tedious, small work, and uh, I don't really know how to explain that question is, except that you just, uh, a lot of times I may have to draw something two or three times because I get it to, you just, and here's the thing about the difference of scrimshaw than, than say painting. Uh, basically painting, you've, just, you've got a canvas or you've got a piece of paper or whatever. They're all the same. Uh, and that's what I love about doing this scrimshaw work. It, it, it's always challenging. Uh, it always keeps you on your toes. You don't get complacent with it because every piece, and basically what I use now mostly is old woolly mammoth fossilized ivory. Uh, they're coming out with a lot of it now since the ice is melting up there and they're, they're getting some good pieces out of Siberia and has tremendous color to it. Uh, but you may start up here working on the top of it and it'd be firmer further you go it starts softening up so you have to just live with it you know mm -hmm. and, and, and baby it along and pull out what's in there and it all has different shapes different colorations and, and so it uh, uh, I just love it and in the fact that I used to, I, and I still do occasionally uh, get a, uh, some Eskimo artifacts Inuit artifacts uh, they didn't have the stone that we do here in this country so a lot of their stuff was made out of fossil walrus tusks and ivory uh, spearheads and harpoon heads and uh, sled runners and stuff. And, and I did a, uh, in fact, I sold a man a collection of 30, almost 300 pieces to one man that I had bought back from a collector of mine who passed away. And there's some tremendous fishing weights and different artifacts in there that are just really hard to get now, you know. and working on those in the studio and you're in there by yourself and you 
you know, your mind goes to drift. I'm working on something here that a man seven or 8,000 years ago used to feed his family, used to survive. He whittled this fishing weight out of a, hacked it out of a piece of walrus tush, you know, and put it on his net or put it on his sled and, and lived in a harsh environment. And, and it almost, uh, uh, it's, it's kind of a eerie, feeling sometimes to realize this, or this Mastodon elephant roamed this country uh, 75,000 years ago. And here I've got a piece of it in my studio. And, and so it's, it's, I just, I love doing that stuff. It, it's a lot more than just painting on the canvas. Mm -hmm. Our, um, the fossilized Mastodon is, do you order that online or do you buy from dealers? Well, do you go in person? Uh, I just bought two pieces here this morning from a friend of mine who got it from a friend of hers in Arkansas mm -hmm. that got it from somewhere else, you know. So, But I do buy a lot of it. And, and used to, you could go, I haven't, but I, it would have been legal for me to go up to Alaska and go to the villages and buy this stuff. But uh, when they were putting the uh, Alaska pipeline in, uh, and I had a lot of friends that went to work up there, and and uh, a lot of it, and it's it's the Eskimos uh, have uh, pretty severe alcohol problem, uh, and one reason is that they're so isolated with nothing to do, especially the young people in these out villages. Well, these people that were up there. Uh, wound up they would trade liquor and, and stuff for huge pieces of mastodon ivory worth thousands of dollars you know and so it was it was getting out of there so the the government came in which it was a, really a great thing and now it's legal to sell it to an they can sell it to an authorized dealer that see they get a fair price for it because that's the way they supplement their income they pick up a lot of this stuff around the same old camps and villages that they travel thousands of years ago for goose season, they go to goose camp. Well, they camp there and made, then they find artifacts and, and it all, it keeps turning up. Well, instead of them just, people just going up there and beating them out of it, they get a fair price to supplement them, helps them, you know, and so I buy it, most of mine through a dealer like mm -hmm. that. Um, do you take, when you're working on wildlife images, do you take photographs or do you work from scrap other photographs or how do you a lot of yeah a lot of times I do now uh, and a lot of times I use uh, uh, photographs that are in uh, maybe uh, books or something you know uh, especially I don't have to do much research on the native animals because I've spent my life in the woods and I pretty much can know what but still, you need to look at a picture sometimes just to make sure that the feet are right or whatever. But if I, somebody wants me to do an African lion, I've got to go find somebody that took a photograph of an African lion, you mm -hmm. know. So, and I have a file of books that, that uh, you know, different uh, National Geographics or different things. And I don't per se copy the pictures, but I use that as a reference to make sure that everything's correct. And I think that's important too that uh, especially doing our Native American stuff. And, and one of my pet peeves was, uh, I, I guess I can't use names that I'd like to, uh, were famous Western artist who traveled uh, from back east in a train, went through and made sketches, went back east and painted, did sculptures. I've looked at them and I've been a cowboy all my life. And, and one of them, a famous stat, uh, sculpture of a cowboy the saddle doesn't even have a blanket under it. No cowboy would ride his horse without a blanket under it. One of them, the bits are turned backwards. <laughs> but another man who is a famous Western artist who lived the cowboy life, did a lot of his work around a campfire, all his stuff is correct, so you owe it to Seth. If you're doing Native American stuff, you need to know that tribe. You need to know what their dress was, what their customs was, what the, what the tattoos look like. A lot of people don't realize that a lot of our early native uh, tribes, the woodland tribes were tattooed, you know. And so if you're going to do a piece and, and sell it to somebody, then it needs to be as correct as you possibly can make everything on it, you know. When you're, um, 
when you've sketched, done a little preliminary sketching for a scrimshaw or whatever, do you do it on tracing paper or? No, a lot of times I just, now I just generally do it on my piece. Mm -hmm. You know, once you get it polished out. Directly and, on there. And I just draw it directly on there. A lot of times I'll, and sometimes I will if I'm laying out a couple of different things, I may scratch out some little primitive, just layout mm -hmm. type thing to see if, if this buffalo head's gonna fit behind this Indian or I wanna put a turtle in or a dragonfly or whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. That's the thing about doing a scrimshaw. If you're you're doing working on paper canvas and you're drawing, making your sketches, you can erase it. Mm -hmm. uh, when you're doing it on this ivory, once you scratch it, you've got one choice: right. either make that work or sand it off and start all over again. You know? Right. Do you work on? Um, I'm any other materials that you carve regularly besides bone or fossilized um, yeah, I've ivory done some, or antler? I've done some bronzes. I've done about four bronzes. Awesome. And, and, uh, what was uh, that experience like? It was pretty cool. You know, it's expensive, <laughs> but uh, I really enjoyed the process. You know, the friends of mine who run the foundry, the bronze horse. Uh, uh, Where is that? In Pawhuska. In Pawhuska, yeah. yeah. And uh, they were a real uh, flexible to work with, you know, and so that process was was pretty neat, you know, and and uh, I've done scrimshaw on jade. I've done it on. Uh, you can basically do this on anything you can sand smooth and scratch, uh, and it's got quite a history. A lot of uh, uh, explorers, the mountain men and stuff, who opened up the west. Uh, a lot of them didn't have pencil and paper. Uh, but nearly all of them carried white powder horns and they would take a knife point and make maps and, and you can see I saw some of these in museums that uh, they make maps to where the passes were through the mountains and different things and and uh, just I was doing uh, some research one time and, and uh, for a Bible class that I was going to teach and uh, I was looking through a, a Bible book that I had and something caught my eye and I looked and there's this elephant tusk scrimshaw in there that came out of a tomb in Egypt and what was depicted on it was a scrimshaw of the exodus of the children of Israel. And so this goes back and it's, it's just, it actually goes back to a caveman taking a stone and scratching into a bone and then rubbing some ashes in it. So it's got a, a rich history to it, you know. Um. Do you always have stories for your work? How important is story? Oh, people like to hear stories, you know? And I try to be as factual as I can up to a point. <laughs> no, but like, the, <laughs> like that, that Western uh, <clears throat> poet that says, I'm gonna tell you facts as long as I can, <laughs> but I'm not gonna quit talking. <laughs> but no, I, you know, I do, people like to know uh, why you did this, what's the story behind it, and, and you know, and, a, and it's like a lot of people that, that see Indian art, and, and I, I did some paintings here. I, last year I read the history of Old Fort Seal about the Indian wars and stuff, you know, and, and growing up I knew I always had some Indian heritage, and I wanted to be a uh, mighty elk or a uh, tall bull or something like that, and I come to find out I go back to an Indian named No Tosh Tubby, which means slow walking turtle. You know, I mean, <laughs> where you go from there, you know. But anyway, a lot of people, I did these horses, uh, two different uh, large paintings of, of cavalry, one cavalry horse and an Indian horse running loose after the battle, you know. And, and with the, one of them stepped, the uh, cavalry horse stepped on his bridle and broke a rein. And, and, and so the Indian horse I, I paint with the uh, symbols, and a lot of people don't have a clue. They think that's just pretty decorations that they put. I said, no. This handprint means that he killed a, a enemy in battle. I said these horse tracks means he's had successful horse stealing raids. I said these eye marks are clan marks, and they're fascinated to know that those actually meant things. So, you you people want to hear what what's the basic behind what you're doing, you know? Do you um, title all of your things? Or? Oh yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. I, I always okay. try to. You know. Even the little scrim shop. Well, the the small jewelry pieces and stuff I don't. But uh -huh. I had a 
a piece of uh, bark mammoth ivory that I'd cut off. It had some bad cracks in it. I thought I can never use that, so I sawed it off and I had it laying around and started throwing it away. And, and I got thinking, I could seal them cracks up, you know. And this a neat looking piece had a beautiful color to it. And the way it come out, the top had naturally been broken off and it looked just like a rocky mountain there. And it, I've got it up there, it's maybe uh, three inches by four and a half or something like that. And I thought, I just, so I did this old mountain man on it, and I put a little kind of grin on his face, not mean and gruff like a lot of them are, you know, a little sneaky kind of grin on this <laughs> old man. Well, I thought, well, I got a title this on the way to town. I was trying to hurry up and get it up here so I could have it for this weekend. So I'm thinking on the way to town, what am I gonna call this? And so I made up this little poem on the way to town, and I, let me see if I can remember it. Uh, I said, I, I trapped, I fought the Blackfeet, and let's see, uh, I trapped the beaver and kissed the bear, I fought the Blackfeet and still got my hair, uh, I live up here till kingdom come, for I am a mountain man by go. So that's the, I had that all and put on this little piece, you know, <laughs> and so, uh, you know, you, you got to have some humor in what you do, you know, and this little guy looked just like he would tell you a lie in a New York minute, you know. <laughs> I hope we get to see that at the end. We're, we're, we're getting to the close here. Uh, how did you come up with your signature? Was there an art to that? Well, I, early I tried different things, fancy stuff and stuff now, and now I just write my name, you know. <laughs> and, and I always, even if it's on a bigger painting or a little small piece, I try to keep my signature pretty minimal. I don't like great big I am this look at me look at my name don't worry about what you're buying here you know I, I, I'm pretty uh, self-conscious you just put your name on there and if they look they do realize it's done by somebody you know so mine's it's pretty simple you know I start out and I have a feather with some of my early stuff and this and that and I thought crap I just write my name on Cole you know <laughs> What's your creative process from the time you get an idea? Sometimes it's pretty slow. <laughs> but no, I, <laughs> you know, I know that this happens to other artists. Uh, or a matter of maybe mechanics or whatever your gift is, you know. It's like, only like me, uh, art has always come fairly easy to me, but when it comes to being a mechanic or a carpenter, all I've ever done with a hammer is, or a wrench is mash my fingers. I can't fix nothing, you know. My wife will not let me touch anything around the house. She hires it done. But the process of, I've got ideas. I'd wake, I'd wake up with ideas for a piece that I never thought of the night before I went to sleep. But when I wake up, I'm gonna go do that. I'm gonna make get up. I've got up in the night and make quick notes and something, you know, that these come to you. Uh, and I, I think the Lord helps you with that stuff. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people that are, are working on an engine and run into a problem, it comes to them the same way. You know, that's a gift that has been given you. And, and so uh, it's hard for me to explain other than I don't. It just happens, you know. <laughs> Do you have a creative routine? Do you work a certain number of hours? Or? Oh no, the crappie's biting, <laughs> fish are biting, the squirrels are cutting hickory nuts, I'm out of there, man, you know? That's one of the things that is beautiful about being uh, self-employed or uh, in my stuff. In the same time I'm off out there, if I'm up the river in my boat, uh, I love, I just feel at ease with nature. You know, and I learn a lot from it. I see things, I see the bark on a tree, and I thought, I'll remember that because I'll use that. You know, maybe a tree that's rotten and limbs broke, or uh, a bird, or whatever. It's all uh, staying in the rhythm of, of life, you know, and it's part of, I think it's a big part of being an artist. I could not be an artist if I had to get up and work eight hours a day in the studio, you know? So I'm a, I may be sitting there watching my court go under, but I may want to paint that copy <laughs> with a picture of it when it comes up, you know? So it's all part of it. Okay, so we're looking at this mountain man piece that you were uh, telling us the poem of. You want to 
Yeah, that's the one I was telling you about a while ago. And if you look at that old, uh, this is called bark ivory. It's actually the piece that's on the outside that takes all the weathering and it, it gives it, it looks just like a tree bark. If you was to see that before it's polished out, you wouldn't even pick it up. Uh, but anyway, you just, a little bit of sand in the stuff, but you can see the big cracks that in that stuff, which is a characteristic of ivory. Uh, all of it has some hair cracks of some kind in it, but uh, you learn how to either incorporate them in in what you're doing or work over them around them, but right. uh, that was a fun piece to do, you know. It's got gorgeous colors. I'm just gonna try to get it at a slightly different angle too. That's beautiful. All right, and how about the knife? Oh yeah, and even the shape of the of the wood piece behind it is imitating that of the knife handle. You want to talk talk about this piece? Yeah, this uh, this piece is done on a actually it's a warthog tush that uh, comes out of Africa, buy them through dealers, and they're just terrible looking when you get them and the, the actually as much work as getting them sanded down past the enamel and polished and once you get into that it's a beautiful high grade of ivory it holds tremendous detail but uh, this i've with these i've incorporated the carving on the end of the eagle head plus the added of the scrimshaw on the knife and actually i even acid etched the blades with eagles and different things in there so uh, I've really had a lot of uh, success with these. They're uh, pretty collectible and, and they've been a good piece for me. And you added the turquoise too, huh? Yeah, I, a lot of times I'll use turquoise or jasper or maybe mm -hmm. black buffalo horn and it just, all of that combined, it just makes it work, you know. The, the scrimshaw piece we looked at are, you know, I, I certainly don't think I've arrived. I'm still uh, trying new things still available. It took me about a year to learn how to color this stuff. And I put some subtle color in it. Uh, you can't just use paint or you can't use dye. And it, it, it's a process that, that uh, a lot of people now that try to pick my brain and just want me to, how do you do that? I want to do, you know, uh, I'll be glad to help anybody teach. I'm, gonna, uh, I'm fixing to maybe start this summer, start having some classes and passing some of the things that I've learned on because I know I'm not going to be able to do this now. Uh, the little tiny stuff, I'm nearly 70 years old, so it's getting hard for me to see. And, mm -hmm. and so uh, these are things that I'm, I'm going to share with other people and, and try to keep it going on. And oh, that's great. How about this piece? This is just gorgeous. Yeah, this so is one of the uh, antler carvings that I were talking about earlier. Uh, this is particular one is carved from moose antler and basically moose carve better than anything because they're one of the few antlers that's pretty solid all the way through them. Uh, they're not like a deer horn or an elk mm -hmm. that have that honeycomb inside of them and, and they make beautiful carvings. They're uh, a little bit tricky because this one uh, is actually thicker than some and it's the thickest part, not over three, <coughs> about three quarters of an inch. So you have to learn how to get some three-dimensional work in such a thin area. So mm -hmm. it's, you learn how to carve stuff back and set stuff forward and it it makes it look alive instead of just a dead piece, you know. Yeah, with the fish and everything, it's just, just gorgeous. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Skip.